Tancy, hello. This is Larissa Crawford. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of Future Ancestor Services. Um, and this is one of our uh, first IG live sharing cues. Happy Sunday, everyone. Happy to see some of y'all joining in, signing in. This is exciting. This is my first time hosting an IG live. Um, so I recognize this is different than a panel. What? I didn't want to ask me. Okay, well, why don't you stick around with Mama for a bit? Um, happy Sunday morning um, to everyone joining in. Um, yeah, so this session is going to be really to the point. It's going to be um, pretty quick. Uh, and I, I recognize y'all are here to get information and dip out. It's a Sunday, <laughs> so I'm going to be sensitive to that. Um, with regards to what I want to chat about today, the session is called Making the Shift to Entrepreneurship. And so really what I want to chat about is um, reflecting on kind of what are the things I did that really set me up well to be an entrepreneur that really developed the skills that I find I'm using the most right now. Um, so particularly in high school and university, but we're going to identify the pieces where um, you don't have to be in university or even in high school to be able to pursue um, certain things that I did. Um, I'm then going to uh, quickly talk about, um, there are a lot of jobs that I had where I found, once I got in there, I experienced a lot of racism, ageism, ableism. I know. Um, I, I didn't find that it was super healthy in a lot of my workplaces. So I'm gonna name some things that I did when I was still working there that I think set me up well to be an entrepreneur. And then I'm going to name the specific things, um, the specific considerations that I made before making that shift from employee to full-time um, entrepreneur. Um, so Sunday, November 15th, is um, what I recognize as my divorce from toxic workplace environments. Um, so this is in celebration of this divorce party. This is really, um, one year out from making that shift, um, uh, these key reflections. So I hope you enjoy it again, as to the point as I can be. Now, before we begin, I just want to, to share that this is a donation collecting effort. Um, so if after the session you feel like you left with something valuable, please take a moment to send even a $5 donation um, to our, um, uh, to our uh, Washishkwan grant fund. Um, so we're seeking to financially support diverse entrepreneurs in what is currently Canada in doing exactly this for themselves in building their um, uh, businesses um, and supporting them in their entrepreneurial journey. So as I'm sharing, if you're getting anything from it, um, please take a moment afterwards to send that um, donation. And our last post, um, explains exactly how to do that. Now, if we're going to dive in, um, I'm going to first talk about the things that I did in high school and university um, that really um, developed the skills that I'm using now. So the first is um, I started, uh, I initiated a fundraiser when I was about 16, 17. I initiated a fundraiser to start a library in Accra, Ghana, and um, to support the development of a library um, on Kainai Blood Reserve. Uh, the public library was being developed at the time and so we were able to um, uh, initiated a fundraiser uh, across the city that um, brought in hundreds of pounds of uh, books and school supplies for um, Accra and then for Kainai Blood Reserve. And so um, I, I, I found that in that process and what anyone could do in that situation and what I really did there um, in high school was I, I, I learned about globalization at that time. I learned about extreme poverty and I recognized, okay, I know this now, what am I going to do about it? And the opportunity presented itself where um, one of my teachers invited me on a trip um, to go with her to um, donate or to travel to Accra, Ghana. And so that's really when I started thinking about what are the things that I can do to to um, to act on the information I now know, um, and so that's really when I started. And I initiated a fundraiser, and and the things that I think I did 
in order to get there was recognizing the responsibility that knowledge carry, um, recognizing that, okay, I know this now, but what am I going to do about it? Especially when opportunities present itself where I'm benefiting from the privileges I have of living where I live and having access to education and having access to mentors that want to present opportunities. Like what can I, how can I use this privilege um, to act on the responsibility of this knowledge? So that's, that's one thing I did that I think that anyone can do is really reflecting on um, what do you do now and, and seeking those opportunities to use your privilege and power as a way to um, address systemic issues, um, as a way to serve um, uh, communities and as, and as a way to address needs. Uh, so that's something I, I very much did. Now that really informed um, what I chose to study in university. So I, I took a double major in co communication studies and international development studies at York University. And there were, even in the selection of my program, programs, I recognized I wanted to do five years. And this was a very good decision and that I strongly recommend to uh, many people entering undergraduate degrees programs. If you can, spend more time in those programs. I know the hustle to get out of programs is so real, but I'm so glad I took that extra year because the five years that I did spend in that program, I was able to take more classes. I took an honors degree. Um, I was really able to explore so many different subjects, but I think more importantly is that I was able to do my courses better because I had less at a time and I was able to work and volunteer, which ended up being the most determining factors in being employable after my degree. It actually wasn't so much what I studied and what I studied was really important. I made sure to balance um, practical um, skills development or skills focused courses with theoretical courses. And that was, that was great. And I find I use a lot of that content every day as an entrepreneur communications and international development studies are great programs and I really like that I put them together. But um, it was what I did outside of my programs that made me employable. And I, I found that when I was looking around me, so many people were rushing through, were trying to do as much as they could quickly to get out at a certain age, um, but hadn't done um, and didn't have the experience of applying what they were learning. Um, and I think that was what made me so employable. So in my university, I, I did exchanges. I traveled as much as possible. Recognizing that now we're in a different, what feels like universe, um, where traveling isn't so much of an option. I think really what made me employable in that situation though was recognizing and naming the fact that I went out of my comfort zone and I put myself in unknown, uncomfortable situations um, and I, had, I developed skills um, that helped me manage that um, and that helped me succeed in those situations or not succeed. I was equally in interviews, equally as open about um, my successes in traveling. I went to Istanbul for a year. I was equally as open in my travels in terms of what I didn't do well um, as much as I was in what I did do well. Um, and so I think if we aren't able to travel, especially right now, I think in the future and like in planning um, for the future, I think I, I really want to encourage people to take their education global to really t put yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, there are different considerations for um, traveling depending on who you are, how you present your identities. Um, but spending the time researching and, and taking the opportunity to explore that discomfort, um, it, it really contributes to those skills of, of, of navigating uncomfortable situations, unknown situations. That can be a skill and if you, the more you practice it, the more you are more aware of yourself and the more you know how to deal with those situations, when you're in them again. And so um, if you aren't able to travel, and as we're not able to travel, I think the, the, um, 
an alternative way to really develop those skills and really articulate that experience is to look for opportunities where it's completely new to you, where either the subject matter or the, um, the culture is completely new to you. Um, and that can be through learning, that could be through online courses, um, and, uh, and, and reflect on what is it that made you uncomfortable and what did you do to overcome that? Um, for example, uh, for a really concrete example, when I went to Istanbul, I really recognized that the language was a huge barrier for me. The culture was a huge shock to me. I didn't study as much as I should have. So in my applications, in my interviews, in my reflections, I mean that like, if you're going to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, an unknown situation, situation, make sure you go in, um, educated. So that was something I didn't do well. The other thing I didn't do well was I didn't, or I guess in the process of um, being there, in especially Istanbul, um, I volunteered a lot with refugees. Um, I was doing translation, I was doing a disbursement of aid. Um, and I recognized that my skills and my lived experience was not appropriate um, to be doing that work. And so, and recognizing that, I often name that in applications and reviews again, like that wasn't an appropriate use of my work, my time, um, and that wasn't an appropriate space for me to be doing that. I wasn't able to serve the, those communities um, to a degree that they should have been. Um, and I, I really, when I reflect on that, um, I not only am recognizing kind of what I did wrong, but like, in naming that awareness for future endeavors and for future efforts. So, so I guess that, that's, a, that's another thing, like putting myself in uncomfortable situations, learning more about myself, um, learning more about what's appropriate. Um, I would love if we, none of us had to realize that what we were doing was inappropriate, wasn't best for the communities. Um, but I yeah. recognize that that's going to, it's going to happen as we're learning. And so, um, naming that for ourselves, um, taking accountability for that, I think is so important. And it's something that really informed uh, my ability to be um, an ethical entrepreneur, I'd say. Um, and the second, and when I was in university, I guess just building off of kind of the other things I did was I volunteered a lot. I volunteered a lot, like 20 to 30 hours per week I was volunteering, even after I had Zyra. Um, and, uh, I know it's difficult to, to look at volunteering, especially now with, um, with more conversation coming around, um, value of labor. Um, but I think there's a difference between recognizing someone's labor and compensating for it, um, and, and volunteering in ethical ways or ethical ways to volunteer. Um, and I volunteered a lot. I volunteered on councils. I volunteered on... Um, for research, for mentors, I volunteered um, as ambassador. I volunteered as so many different things. Because I recognized I have skills and I have wisdom, but I want to build those skills and I want to build that wisdom to the point where I can go into a situation and I can, and I can feel good about asking about compensation. Um, I recognize that I want experience so that I feel like I'm in a position where I know I should be compensated for that work. Um, and volunteering for me at least served the purpose of exploring different areas of work and kinds of work that I liked. And one thing that I really latched onto was research, contract research. And the way I, I learned how I love to do that was volunteering um, uh, for one of my mentors, approaching one uh, and how he became my mentor was really approaching him, Dr. Lauren Foster, after a session and literally just asking him, what can I do to support you? What, what can I do for you? And asking that question opened up so many opportunities to start aligning my volunteer work with something that I recognized as um, having impact and work that I was very attracted to with regards to the topic and what communities were being served. Um, so I went and asked, what can I do for you? Um, and that was a really, um, uh, that was a really, I think, um, 
out of all my experiences in university, volunteering was the most transformational in terms of applying what I was learning to, um, uh, to in practice um, and being able to demonstrate that as I was applying to jobs. Um, and I'll kind of trans start transitioning into like after university, after I graduated, um, or I mean, as I was graduating, uh, some of the things that really set me apart from other applicants was the volunteering, um, but not just volunteering. Like if you're volunteering, articulate why it's meaningful, reflect on what are you actually doing? What are the skills you're building? Um, and again, for example, when I was traveling um, as a volunteer for conferences or in Istanbul, I recognized the skills and the teachings and I named that. I made a list and I named that. Um, and then as I was writing applications, as I was preparing for interviews, I identified how those pieces were transferable. Um, what kind of skills, what concrete skills did I learn from those experiences? Um, and, and so I'd, I'd say that was, that was a really big piece. Now, I, the final piece that I'd say that set me up well to be an entrepreneur um, was spending a lot of time reflecting on my ancestry and identity. So if I go back to the time that I was in Istanbul, when I left, um, I didn't feel like I had any more idea of what I really wanted to do than when I got there. If anything, I felt more lost. And in that sense of feeling lost, um, I took the time to, uh, I, I, I took the time to, and I invested a lot of energy into understanding better who I am. Um, and this is an important, this is important because one teaching that I received, especially after realizing that what I was doing in Istanbul was inappropriate, um, was that when we're more sure of ourselves and understand and have that self-awareness, we are better positioned to enter situations, uncomfortable situations, new situations, cross-cultural situations, um, and maintain our sense of identity. Because if we go into um, cultural contexts that are not familiar to us or that are not our own, Without a, a solid understanding of ourselves, we run the risk of adopting, of misappropriate, or of appropriating other cultures in ways that are inappropriate, uh, unethical, and in ways that don't actually serve the community in any way. Um, and in learning that, it, it was a, an elder who told me this shortly after I got back. And after learning that, I invested a lot of time in understanding my ancestry and understanding my group identities. So I invested in um, volunteering for research, uh, research programs, um, or research on my identities. I went to every panel I could. I went to and read as much as possible with regards to classes, with regards to research. I started changing or making sure that my research topics or my paper topics in my university classes um, explored these topics. Um, so there, were, there was a very intentional effort to understand who I am. And um, I think that's so important as an entrepreneur um, for us to enter this work knowing who we are, who we belong to, um, and to go into that work, allowing that to inform how we understand our role in making impact in serving communities. Now, uh, now I can jump into kind of when I got the jobs that I got. So right after university, I, um, I got a position with the Ontario Provi for Provincial Government, which um, after that position, I got another position in Provincial Government. Um, and then when I moved back to Calgary, I got um, a, a position, the only position I really wanted at a granting firm. Um, and so I landed all the jobs I wanted because of the work I did in articulating and applying what I was learning um, in my earlier years. 
But when I got these jobs, um, in many cases, I came to realize the very real ways that racism, ableism, ageism affects people in the workplace. So I very quickly realized, um, for example, and I'll name the position. So when I was working at the Ontario Ministry of Energy, I, came, I became very aware very quickly of how second class um, Indigenous issues or relations or considerations are. Um, so I, I realized really quickly how individual level prejudice um, and uh, racism or bias against um, Indigenous peoples in this case informed how policy was being made. It informed what kind of programs were being made. It informed how we were assessing um, different situations. Um, and people were allowed to act on, on these beliefs. And I was seeing very quickly the impact that it was having at a systemic level, how I was treated in those rooms. Um, I was in many cases, the youngest people and the youngest person in all of my positions. Um, and recognizing how that was informing how I was being treated. In one position, I was downgraded from a more senior role that I was being hired for because of my age. But in practice, I ended up leading a lot of the work because I had the most applicable experience and education to what we were doing and lived experience to what we were doing. Um, with regards to my chronic pain disability, I was finding that uh, management was super resistant to honoring the accommodations I needed. And so I was going through this in a lot of my different workplaces, but I recognized I'm not in a position where I can just quit or just leave. I'm not in a position where I can just not be working Mama, right now. You said you're all done. Yeah, mommy will be quick. Um, I can't just leave. And so what I did to get through those times and recognizing this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it's likely that I don't want to be an employee for the rest of my life. If this is what being an employee looks like. Um, I, uh, there are a couple things that I did. The first was I, I had very honest conversations with my management. Um, so in starting a new position, um, I had very honest conversations about what I was looking to get out of the position, um, what kind of skills I was looking for, and what my boundaries were. Um, especially when I was at the Ministry of Energy. Um, what my boundaries were with regards to, I am coming here as a Black and Indigenous person. There's no separating that from my work. Um, and that is something I need to stay true to myself in terms of the work that I do here. Um, and it came out being really useful that I had done that, especially with my manager at the time, because some assignments came down where um, I could not in good faith contribute to some of those assignments um, because of the intention um, that that work was being done with. And I, I had to have a conversation with my manager. I, I made very clear at the early parts of, um, and early on in my role, that these are my boundaries. Um, and I, I really feel like this assignment is infringing on this boundary. Is there another assignment I can take on? Um, because I'll be, and I said this, I'll be straight up. If I have to work on this, I'm going to intentionally sabotage this work. I was very straight up with that. Um, and so having that transparency, having that kind of an conversation early on in a relationship, in a formal relationship with my superior, um, helped me assert my boundaries later on when I really needed to. Um, I'd say another thing that I did was I, I looked for opportunities to support learning in the spaces. And I did this in a lot of my different, in a lot of my positions where 
um, uh, I would organize a lunch and learn if I found that everyone was kind of having a misconstrued understanding of the real living legacies of residential schools. Um, in one position, I held a, a full on lunch and learn for everyone. Um, and I shared information about residential schools. Um, and it was very cool how transformative that session was um, in terms of how people acted afterwards. Um, it's okay, it's okay, baby. And how people treated our work afterwards. But um, I, I, I did that in recognizing, you know what, I may not be treated with respect here. I may not be recognized um, for my value because of my age, or because of my gender, race, whatever. Um, but I'm, I'm still going to look for opportunities to demonstrate that value, whether they want it or not. <laughs> Um, and that was actually a really cool process. Um, and that, that's something that I usually refer back to in applications, in interview processes, where I can demonstrate leadership, I can demonstrate overcoming adversities um, in a way that resulted um, in a, a positive trajectory, um, a forward trajectory. And so um, that's something I did that I think really helped. Um, now, when I was working, um, I also kept a journal. I chronicled every incident where I felt like race, ability, age, gender was a factor in how I was mistreated. Um, and, and I named that. I, I, I kept a journal. I even sometimes copied um, and pasted emails. And I, I recommend this, especially if you're in a position where you feel like this is a re recurring issue. Um, in the workplace is to, to do this um, because whether you need to ho um, hold someone accountable, you, you have that paper trail. But I'd say as an entrepreneur, I reflect back on all the instances where I felt disrespected um, and I allow that to inform how I work now. So I looked at what I really loved about what my management did and then what really sucked. I looked at how people were treating me um, and how I want to make sure I don't treat others for them to feel the way I did in those situations. For example, in one of my positions, I had the same title, the same level of power in the structure as everyone else in the team. But I was also, I am also uh, about 20 years younger than anyone else in the, in the organization. And although I should have been on paper afforded the same respect, the same consideration for my contributions as anyone else, I was always left out of meetings, my recommendations were not acted on, um, and I was regularly pushed to the side for no other reason but my age and the perceived value that I carry at that organization. So I, I write that down because I'm aware now that if I have a team, um, I'm not going to, and I actually make an effort not to treat anyone like they have less value on the team, but I recognize the feeling and impact that has on me. And I recognize that I can't be doing that to my team. I can't be doing that to the people I'm working with as an entrepreneur. Um, so that was really valuable, that practice of doing that when I was in jobs where I, I didn't like it, how I was being treated. I made very clear note of what was happening, what was me, how it was making me feel. And now, as someone who supports different workplaces in addressing those kind of issues, I'm regularly going back to those instances for storytelling, to humanize different concepts. We can talk about workplace racism, but what does it actually look like and what's the actual impact? I'm able to draw on those stories and experiences to humanize those kind of ideas, those kind of concepts. And this is someone that anyone can do in any line of work, for any line of work. We need to be addressing these situations everywhere. Um, so I, I'd say that that was a, that, that was a practice that I, I try to communicate to people who can't leave their positions um, and who need to um, make some meaning out of it. That's how I made meaning out of positions 
where I was not respected, where I didn't want to stay, but where I had to stay for the time being. Now, I'll, I'll wrap... I'll kind of wrap it up and then I'll go through some questions. So if you have any questions, I'd, I'd recommend starting to put them in the chat now. Um, but I'd say what prepared me um, to actually make the transition from employee to entrepreneur um, was a few things. So when I was working, when I was even in university, um, I was doing what I, I thought I wanted to do in a volunteer capacity, but I, I just kept doing it. So I knew I wanted to do contract work. From volunteering research, at, when I was a student, I recognized, wow, this is something I really like. It's something I'm good at. It meets my skills and it meets my working ethic where I can do something really intense for this amount of time and then I really like when it's just that. Um, and so I realized, wow, this is something I really like doing. I want to keep on um, exploring it. And so all throughout university, all throughout on the side of my all my jobs that I didn't um, that were I was struggling through, um, I made sure to to keep meaningful work um, along that process. And in doing so, um, I continued to do contract work on the side. Um, and in doing all that contract work on the side. Um, I found that I got to a point where, you know what, I, I feel confident in my skills and abilities. Um, I feel like I've built a network. I feel like I've developed um, uh, a capacity to be able to do this a lot. So that, that was something that made me feel prepared to make the transition. The other thing was I was saving. So I was not going on expensive fancy trips. I was not buying all the clothes I wanted to. I wasn't buying expensive coffees. I wasn't doing that. I was saving. Um, and I was saving because I was starting to recognize, you know what, there's going to be a point in time where I want to make the transition to an entre being an entrepreneur. And I don't want to be in debt because of it. Now, this is unique in that um, there weren't a lot of startup costs for us because we're a specific kind of service um, where we don't actually really need too much to do our services uh, beyond the skills and education that we gather. In terms of like upfront costs, there wasn't a lot um, for uh, starting up Future Ancestor Services. Um, and so I recognized, you know what, I want to be able to do this from my savings. I don't want to have to take out loans. And that was the decision I made. Um, uh, and so I saved. So I got to a point, and I think whether you're saving or, or not um, for all the startup costs or if you end up taking out loans, I think the biggest factor in making that decision on a financial, um, on financial terms was um, do I have enough, do we have enough where we will be financially stable for at least four months from the time I quit, from the time I leave my job. And I gave myself four months to really be invested in this work, to really trust myself. Um, and I had the financial capacity to support the family for four months after I quit. Recognizing that if I, I didn't like it or if I wasn't, um, if I wasn't succeeding to the um, degree that I expected, that I recognize within that last month, I'd probably have to start looking for another job. I could still do this work, but I can't be pursuing it full time if it means um, the instability for our family. So I, I made the, the conscious decision and I, I really looked and evaluated and gave myself time to do this full time, recognizing that if this doesn't go as planned, I recognize I'm going to, at this point, need to start looking for other employment as I continue to pursue entrepreneurship. So that's, that's something I did. And then lastly, um, before I start taking questions is, I was patient. So I recognized that I wanted to start something. I wanted to do this work full time and I wanted to be my own boss about six years ago. Um, but I also recognize, and this was a really important teaching I got from International Development Studies, um, uh, especially the humanitarian sector, especially nonprofit sector, is oversaturated 
with organizations and people doing the exact same work but competing for those res for finite resources often financial resources um, one teacher in particular spoke quite a bit to this phenomena of <laughs> people starting something just to say they started something and that really stuck with me and I see that a lot. People starting something just to say they started something, to put on their resumes, to put in their job titles, whatever the case. But if you actually look at the work that's being done, we can recognize that there are actually a lot of organizations that are maybe doing that work better and more appropriately. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't one of those people. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I wasn't starting something just to start something. I was, wanted to make sure that ego wasn't a part of this decision, which is why I spent my time building my network, learning from pros, learning from mentors, um, being confident in my own identity and understanding who I am, understanding the communities I'm seeking to serve. So spending time in them, with them, learning from them. I spent a lot of time going through the concept, future ancestor services. I got that idea three years ago. Um, and at that time, sure, I could have started it. But I recognized I still need to build my network. I still need to make sure that I'm fulfilling a gap in services right now and that I can go in and fill that gap appropriately. And at that time, Mama. I knew I didn't have the skills Mama. and the knowledge to do that appropriately. Mama, can you just set up here a little bit? Yes, Ma give mommy 10 more minutes. Um, and that was, that was the biggest thing that brought me to, okay, my boundaries are being pushed with this job. I have financial capacity because I've saved. And... I've been patient. I've thought about this for a really long time. And you know what? I'm in a position now where let's do it. I feel like I can do this appropriately. I recognize that I don't need to do this alone, which is why that network piece comes so important. Because I built a network in the fields that I wanted to work in, I was able to identify key people. Um, in with whom I wanted to start this work. Recognize, I, I mean, I hated school projects. I hated group projects. So I had this thinking that, oh, I never wanna, I hate working in teams. And it's actually, no, I don't hate working in teams. It's just, I needed the right teams. I needed those relationships with my team members. And so in building my network, I identified some key people where their work alignment, their work ethic, their mandates, their, their values, and their, their personalities really aligned with who I am, what I'm trying to do, what kind of space, what kind of work am I trying to create. Um, and I recognize that I want them in the process of defining what this is, particularly Chuck and Sam. <laughs> They're the founding directors. They're the ones who I brought on really early on. Um, to define, um, and Monica, to define what we're, look, what we're doing. Um, and I'd say that is the final, I guess, piece is after I did make that shift, it was finding the people who I wanted to define this with. So let me just uh, check out the chat. Let's see. There's a, oh, thanks y'all for your comments. Now let's see the chat. I think I've seen the first question just here. Um, how did you navigate deciding which resources to access to develop your enterprise from an ethical perspective? This is a really good point. A um, couple things. Uh, I really identified what do I like as someone who works? Me, I like when I can access anything online, everything online, where all the documents are kind of housed online, um, and where I can get direct support. And I recognize I want to be supporting um, businesses that are in 
what is currently Canada. And so a key organization that helped me in the incorporation and legal part of um, setting up Future Ancestor Services was Founded. So Founded, um, if you just search it, if you search Founded Incorporation um, Canada, you'll see a business come up. And Founded really changed my whole feeling about incorporating all the legal documents. They changed my whole feeling about annual reports. They, they changed everything. Annual returns, sorry, they changed everything. Um, and they have an amazing team of support staff who um, you can book calls in, 15 minute calls. I highly recommend before you do anything just to set up an intro call. Found it is what I highly recommend um, if you're looking to incorporate um, uh, federally or provincially. Uh, they are really, they have everything figured out. They are really good. And they have a diverse team. I always look at a business. I always look at their team members if they have pictures and they have a very diverse team. Um, they have um, really comprehensive resources. Um, and I really strongly recommend them. Um, founded um, is one that I really strongly recommend. Um, another source of um, a, a resource in starting out on this journey um, has been fellowships and um, programs. So Action Canada Fellowship was a big one. Um, I made the transition to being an entrepreneur when I was in that fellowship program actually. Um, uh, the Youth Climate Lab Future Exchange Program was a really big one. Um, that was a um, that was a, a four or five month program where we traveled to Inuvik last year this time, and I actually quit my job the day before I went, or like a couple days before I left. Um, that was a big deal for me, um, and that program really helped me understand how important it is to include. Uh, particularly Indigenous voices from the North and in recognizing how how much just beauty, value, brilliance. Um, and I'm just getting goosebumps thinking about people in the North. Like I draw, I have so, I draw so much inspiration from them, their teachings, their ways of life, their resilience. Um, and it's something I'm very passionate about and it's something that's really informed how I operate. So that learning experience really, um, really shaped um, and created many resources for how and what I wanted to focus on um, as an entrepreneur. Um, and now I'm part of the Fireweed Fellowship, which is specifically for entrepreneurs, Indigenous entrepreneurs, um, and recognizing that as a resource. And then the cohort, the not Community Knowledge Exchange Cohort X Climate Justice Fellowship. Um, is also an extremely um, useful resource and it has been especially with regards to the financial support that they offer that a lot of fellowships um, uh, aren't able to typically offer or don't offer and so um, fellowships and, and if I, I put this in a more general term um, decentralized education opportunities um, seeking those out there's, and there's a lot. Um, Canadian Roots Exchange offers some really cool ones. Um, uh, and actually, just go through our, our list of uh, accounts that we follow on Ancestors Future. There are a lot of really cool organizations offering free, um, accessible learning programs. Student Energy offers a lot of really cool ones, too. Um, and pursuing those. Um, I didn't... I didn't go to post-secondary, like a grad program right out of university. I, I really prioritized those decentralized and often decolonial um, education programs, which I found have been extremely resourceful in understanding the kind of entrepreneur I want to be. How did you um, pivot from starting your business to bringing a team, team members really quickly? Did you bring people on uh, consulting basis or did you um, receive startup capital to get things going so I, th I see two pieces one team member and the other capital Mama, can you send my paper? yes baby oh I'm so close to being done um what? I'm so close to being done I will 
Um, so team members, I, again, spent a lot of time building my network and identified people in my network who I know I can work well with. Um, and as we're bringing on new people, our team is growing quite quickly because of uh, the number of clients we have and the demand for our services. Um, and the way that we really choose team members is again, um, as of right now, recognizing that we don't have the internal infrastructure um, to, to do so much that I would love to do. Um, we really have to be selective in who we bring on and recognizing they have to really work well with us um, because we can't rely on policy yet. We can't, we, we do have conflict resolution policy and some policy, but we can't rely on the infrastructure a more established organization would have um, to have a whole bunch of employees that maybe don't know each other or that um, we don't know as well. And so um, lately, we've been spending a lot of time and how we've brought on new people is really, um, we've worked with them in some capacity before, so we are aware of their work ethic, we're aware of their work values, um, and we're aware of, uh, of how they are team members. Um, we also uh, use a subcontractor model, so we actually don't have employees. I'm the only technical employee. And I really like a subcontractor model because it, it, it allows for us to maintain a certain agency over each of our own work. Um, so with the subcontractor model, um, Future Ancestor Services is a brand, and then we work with Sam, Chuck, Mo, um, and the new people that we're bringing on um, as contractors. So they're independent contractors who are working for Future Ancestors. So we get the contracts and then they, we technically subcontract them. So they're independent contractors. Um, and this was really appealing as a startup because um, there are less um, responsibilities than if they're employees. Um, but then it also creates the opportunity to really identify like what works well. And independent contracting um, relationships work well because um, it allows for if Trick gets a contract, um, or he's if he's assigned a contract, he has full leadership, full control over that contract. And I like that. I like that we have our full control um, over our work. Um, that's just aligned with what I want our work to be um, and the kind of um, the kind of uh, work that you can do as someone a part of our teams. Um, now, another way that we built our team, and this is also a resource that I strongly recommend, um, is uh, virtual gurus. So check them out. They're on Instagram. Um, uh, they're on Twitter. They're on, uh, they have a website. Um, and this is a really cool business. Um, and it's actually owned by um, an indigenous queer um, person who is, and it's actually based in Calgary where we're based. Um, but Bobby's really cool. I followed their work for a long time and it's really cool to support that business. But then also it's really cool to benefit from that business because they connect you with specialized assistants, um, specialized support people. Um, and so that's where we found our executive enabler of relationships, Mariah, um, who's amazing and who is by profession an executive assistant. Um, but we were able to find those people were able to find video editors, we're able to find website designers, we're able to find bookkeepers all through this, this resource. I strongly recommend it. If you are in a position where you can look around and find someone who you want to be on your team, build your team through virtual gurus. It is super cool. Um, and they, how they manage it, how you pay, like it's just a monthly um, fee. You can have 50 hours, you can have 10 hours. Really cool program, which has totally transformed the kind of work we're able to do because of the support we're getting from them. Um, so strongly recommend that. Um, and then as for startup capital, um, again, I can't speak too much to this because I didn't seek out loans. Uh, I really, I saved. And so my upfront costs for starting future ancestor services was probably um, about $5,000 for all the programs I wanted to buy. And I still pay out of pocket, pocket for a lot of our subscriptions. 
Um, and so our monthly subscriptions are probably about $500 um, off the top of my head. I believe that's what we're at right now um, beyond our annual subscriptions. And so, um, I mean, I'm in a position where I'm able to reinvest some of my income to the company um, and I, I, I saved. Um, there are a lot of different resources um, and we're currently building a bank of that at Future Ancestor Services. Um, but I, I guess many of the resources or exposure that I have had to um, grant opportunities have been from uh, have been from these fellowship programs and understanding them. But then also, um, we qualify for a lot of grants because we're set up as a social enterprise, because we're impact driven and because of how we handle our profits. So um, I think that's a big consideration too. Uh, I chose not to be a nonprofit um, because I recognized I want sustainable income from the, the organization um, and uh, and recognizing and one of my biggest fears of not being a nonprofit was access to grants but with so many grants coming out right now especially for black and indigenous um, owned businesses and in what is currently Canada there is so much support out there for us right now um, so when you're thinking of do you want to incorporate as a for-profit and you have to incorporate as a for-profit in order to be a social enterprise because we, we don't have in Canada a specific um, category to incorporate as a social enterprise. So you have to incorporate as a for-profit, um, but you can structure as a social enterprise. Um, and because of that, we qualify for a lot of grants. It's just a matter of sitting down and writing them. Um, but uh, we qualify for a lot of grants because of the way we've structured ourselves. So. Um, I think that's a big consideration to make too as you're kind of exploring being an entrepreneur. Now another question, do you have suggestions of funding and startup resources for social entrepreneurs? Um, that's where I would really go to really think about how you want to structure because it's going to look so different depending on if you're a nonprofit, a charity, um, a social enterprise. It's going to look really different what kind of funding options you can have. Um, so I, I'd recommend Thinking about that first, how much funding will you need up front for something like this? Um, and Raven Capital Investments actually has some really cool resources too. Um, they're the people who, they're the, the home organization or one of the home organizations that's running um, the Fireweed Fellowship, which I'm a part of. Click on the Fireweed Fellowship, check that out. Um, but I believe they have some resources as well. Um, and again, I'd say stay up to date on the government funding sources. Um, so stay up to date, follow the Twitter pages of relevant ministries and relevant funding agencies. Um, I follow like um, Indigenous Innovation. I follow a whole bunch of different granting agencies or different organizations that hold government grants and disperse them. I follow them on Twitter because that's where I typically find the most updated opportunities um, and deadlines. Um, so I, I'd recommend going through Twitter and starting to follow them um, and, and bringing them into your timelines um, and do regular check-ins on those because um, a lot of organizations doing really great work and have really great funding opportunities um, often don't do a great job at promoting them. Um, and so you really have to look for them. And so Twitter has been a, a place that I've found a lot of those opportunities. And recognizing that awards um, can be sources of funding too. We've applied to a lot of different awards um, for funding opportunities. And I think that's all the questions I have. Oh, one more. What was the determining factor of going, um, of going to incorporate versus processing as a side or as a sole proprietor. Uh, I, I actually operated as a sole proprietor for four or five years. Um, and so being a sole proprietor just means that you don't, um, that you aren't in an incorporated business. And I loved being a sole, um, a sole proprietor. If I'm doing consulting work and it's just me and I recognize I, I just want to work with just me right now. Um, be, and actually all of our 
team members are sole proprietors as well. I really liked it. I'd say the, the biggest cautionary tale that I will share about being a sole proprietor is to keep your books in order. Uh, I recommend uh, QuickBooks uh, Entrepreneur, um, their entrepreneur program, or um, sorry, uh, subscription. I love QuickBooks. I, I tried a lot of different bookkeeping um, programs and I really like QuickBooks. And they have, um, they have a subscription for sole proprietors, um, but it will help you in your invoicing estimates, um, but it will also help you keep track of your books. Um, so that's, that's my biggest cautionary tale about being a sole proprietor is you still have to keep track of a lot of things that businesses have to. Um, and keeping that in order in a program like the QuickBooks Entrepreneur subscription is something I highly recommend. Um, and uh, and uh, investing in those accountants. Um, uh, it's not worth the stress. Um, and uh, you can get money back. And I think that's like as a sole proprietor, you can still you can still have business expenses. You can still um, if you're working from home, you can still allocate and get tax returns on, on different utilities, different phones, internet, all those things. Um, so don't miss out on that money because you aren't tracking it. Um, so I strongly recommend getting a bookkeeping program or an account, like at a program to track that. And I, I really enjoyed, um, the QuickBooks programs. Um, and uh, yeah, you can still get a GHT HST as a sole proprietor number as a proprietor, so you can still collect taxes as a sole proprietor. Um, but I, I do recommend um, fully understanding what a, full, a sole proprietor means. So doing that research and understanding it. Now, my biggest transition to going and incorporating was recognizing I want to bring on more people. I want to work with a team, um, and recognizing that many of the clients that I'm looking to work with. Um, will require a GHT, a HST number, will require a business number, um, and will be expecting an incorporation. Um, and so uh, recognizing that, like, in my line of work, I wanted to make sure we're working with government. I wanted to make sure we're working with big firms, um, law firms, um, firms in energy, all of those different things. And some kind of organizations, some kind of corporations will not be able to work with a sole proprietor, um, especially in the energy field. A lot of organizations have policies where they can't work with a sole proprietor. They have to work with um, a, an incorporation um, or an incorporated body. And so that, that was part of the decision. And then um, lastly, I'd say um, it, it was just... I felt like I was ready. I understood and was accustomed to um, the kind of practices that made me successful as being a sole entrepreneur or a sole proprietor, and I was ready to take that next step. So that's all the questions I have. Um, this was really fun. I hope you all got something out of it. And just a reminder, if you did get something out of it, to send along a small donation if you're able. $5 or more would be awesome. Um, to donation at futureancestors.ca. You can see all the details of how to do that in our last um, uh, published um, post. Um, but thank you so much. Yes, baby, I am so done. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Zara, you want to say hi? Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you want more of these, let us know when we post this. Um, and we'll look into having more of our team members do this more often. So thank you, everybody.